yesterday okay uh we finished a little early uh i made a note to myself uh, i talked to what to one student this morning about their input on it i know that for some of you guys you use the time well for uh frq corrections because they have to be done in person uh but i also realize that's what seminar is kind of for too so um apologies about if you felt like i should have kept on going i just am having a hard time timing everything so i'm still figuring it out so apologies if that felt like a waste of time for you but then you guys had the post lecture, which I filmed early, not sure how much I was going to get done. And this is where we went over polarity and electronegativity. Like you can quantify a bond and particularly an entire molecule made up of multiple bonds as polar or nonpolar. Am I not only sharing equally or unequally between two across the whole molecule of five atoms, right? With maybe one central and four terminal spokes okay, attached to it, is my overall molecule having a region of slightly more negative or slightly more positive, right? And so that's what we're looking at, all right? And there was some calculations, basic math, basic math. You would be given the respective values if you were asked to calculate the electronegativity difference. But uh, otherwise, they might just ask you to memorize the trend, which you're already familiar with. This is just numbers with it. And it's called the Pauline scale because some guy named Paul Ling made the scale. I hope to one day have a Judy scale. That'd be cool. A little AJ scale, a little Allie scale. That's cute. I'm not going to be that smart. Um, so the one thing that you want to remember, though, all else fails. Remember, all rows lead to flooring. All rows lead to fluorine, okay? Fluorine is the four. Four for fluorine, okay? Or four for fluorine it, okay? So then I kind of showed you guys some depictions of how you might illustrate polarity when there's a dipole, a region of two poles, a region of partial positive, partial negative. Partial, partial, partial is the key word. Can you have a full region of negativity if you're polar? No, because that requires a full electron transfer. You're still technically sharing, just not well. Okay, kind of like when, I never mind, I thought to sell out those boys in the back, but I won't. Not today, parents, not today. So um, this is also why we call hydrogen plus a halogen uh, an ionic compound. Because despite it being two non-metals, despite it being two non-metals, which would typically be shared electrons, it is so polar, it is ionic. It's a full transfer. So that's why we put hydrogen. Hey, Copa Kai, could you just, okay. It's why we put hydrogen on the alkali metal column, even though it's not a metal, okay? I got to move. Today's a jittery day for me. I got to move. Yes, yes. Um, so that's where we would, and then I talked a little bit about the little solids, little solid life, okay? Uh, molecular solids are really an introduction to your unit three topic, which is about 22% of the AP usually, question bank. And we'll talk about IMFs. So far, all of these types of bonds, ionic, covalent, and metallic, okay? Metallic bonding kind of being its own little deal. These are all examples of what we call intramolecular forces. In here, I'm going to put it up here, actually. Okay, uh, intramolecular forces are the forces held by bonds or the forces that make bonds. So your ionic, covalent, and metallic are called intramolecular forces. They're the strongest forces between atoms that can occur because you're having an actual electron exchange happening of some sort, all right? So, <clears throat> so um, you're going to want to know this because it's going to become different when we talk about intermolecular forces, inter, okay? So... We're going to stop there, though. That was your overcap on the bonding, recap on the bonding. Uh, let's talk about your do now. So, gee, Willikers, I can't see my own do now. Okay, determine if a bond is polar or non-polar. Draw the dipole area if dipole arrow is polar. So, nitrogen and oxygen, polar or non-polar? Shout it out. Polar. Which one's more electronegative? 
So the dipole arrow is going to head to the oxygen. Okay. Um, I wish I was a little kid because I'd pick up my niece and I'd like, show him like an arrow like Superman. But yeah. Okay. Um, sulfur and iodine. Polar, nonpolar. Nonpolar. So can you draw any dipole moment? No. Okay. Carbon and hydrogen. Polar. But here's a fun fact about carbon and hydrogen. If you have a purely carbon hydrogen molecule, the entire molecule is nonpolar. It is your classic nonpolar molecule. A carbon hydrogen molecule made up of just carbon and hydrogen actually end up being nonpolar as overall. Because for an entire molecule to be polar, for an entire molecule to be polar, and we'll talk more about this in unit three, you have to have asymmetry. But you could technically have two polar parts and they just cancel each other out like tug of war. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, lithium and chlorine. They're so polar, they're ionic. Exactly, 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 exactly. So uh, describe the three types of metallic structures. No, I don't want to go over it. You can see the picture, okay? Uh, honestly, that is probably, if you're lucky, one MCQ. It is on the AP course description. I have yet to see a problem that has much to do with it past 2015. But every year, the AP does cycle out problems. You'll notice trends. So they might pull one up soon, okay? So now today is all about Lewis structures. And Lewis structures are cool, because here's why. Lewis structures, okay, are a method of modeling or illustrating, whatever word you like better. If you're into fashion, modeling. If you're into art, illustrating. Only the valence electrons involved in bonding within a molecule. Uh, Lewis structures are really sick. Here's why. They put on paper what you can't see in life. You cannot see a water molecule when you look at water, okay? You see the giant vat of water molecules, but that's about it. You see the many, many moles, but you do not see the molecule itself. Lewis structures, they're the game changer. They give sight to what cannot be seen, okay? Here's the key. One dot is equal to one electron. Ooh. Okay, one line is equal to two shared electrons. So something you should know, Lewis structures are the most useful for illustrating covalent bonds or covalently bonded molecules, for illustrating covalently bonded molecules. And these poor previous AP students, I listened to this for like the second or third time, these poor souls, covalently bonded molecules. Honestly, I should get you guys like noise canceling headphones so you don't have to listen to me. Um, okay, don't say anything, don't agree, just. <laughs> well, you know what, you can go to the back room, okay? I know. So yeah, you can leave now. Um, most useful, no, my voice would cut through the door. Most useful for illustrating covalently bonded molecules. So there's a couple rules that we follow in order to determine how things bond. The first rule is known as the duet rule, and it only applies to two elements, hydrogen, and helium. When sharing electrons, they share in such a way that they want access to two valence electrons. That's how they like to share. That determines how we draw and illustrate the bonding patterns via Lewis structures. But the most common rule that applies to most elements is the octet rule. And that's saying that they want access. Oh no, what is that word? They want access. Sorry guys, sometimes my hand gets shaky and it gives out. Access to eight valence electrons. Hint, 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 like a noble gas, right? Ele isoelectronic with a noble gas, isoelectronic, okay? So, <clears throat> if you would like to start calculating the, the, the curves, cool. 
You bought your know. computer? Bless. Yeah, they're in there. I just, I don't know. I don't have any information about which students. That it's all in there. comments on the grade. When you log into my Canvas. Okay. I'll see if I it's all the comments. Yeah. So everybody, uh, your scores, by the way, are completely raw right now. They're just your raw score. Charlie has been an angel. Charlie's an angel. Charlie has been an angel and has developed the, that's a stellar movie. Um, the old one's even better, I think. Um, um, well, anyway, he's developed a, a spreadsheet that should hopefully get it right. Yes. Oh, not too late. So, okay. So the octet rule is applies to most, okay? It's the, it explains why all elements will, in an ionic bond, lose or gain in order to get to an octet. But here we're not losing or gaining electrons. Now we're sharing. So now this is a different way to get to that full S and P. Full S, two electrons, full P, six electrons, okay? Mm -hmm. S and P, I was, I was trying to figure out how to do it. <laughs> S and P, okay? So here's the steps. Uh, my, I have all the steps written out. We're just going to do it. And there's actually a digital cheat sheet for you, but we're going to go through one. So let's try, um, uh, ammonium. Okay. Ammonium is a polyatomic ion that when alone unbonded is just characterized as a charged covalent molecule. So what we do is step number one for drawing the Lewis structure. Step number one for illustrating how they share electrons to create the molecule that they do is calculate the total valence electrons and add or subtract for a charge. So each nitrogen brings in, okay, five valence electrons, okay? Each hydrogen brings in one valence electron and the charge of plus one plus means that I am going to have to subtract one valence electron from my count. So I get a total valence electron count of five plus four minus one, which is eight valence electrons. Okay, that's step one of how to begin drawing the Lewis structure. Okay, step one, calculate the total amount of valence electrons that your atoms involved in the molecule are bringing, kind of like a potluck. Okay, everyone know what a potluck is? <laughs> no, yes? Okay, I used to teach at another school and they were like, that's such a, they're like, that's such a white person thing. I'm like, well, I was always in the white neighborhood. So yeah, so potluck is when you bring all the food, right? And what do you do? You each bring food and you, one, don't just eat the food you brought, you redistribute. You take count and then you redistribute. That's the same thing that we're gonna do. We're gonna do a potluck with electrons to build the molecule and make sure everybody has what they want, either two or eight, okay? And so now that we've counted up our total, now we're going to redistribute, but we got to figure out who to redistribute to. So what we have to do is next step, step two, draw the skeleton. So we got to figure out, okay, for a molecule, there's always a central atom, okay? So we need to look at for the skeleton drawing, we need to figure out what the central versus the terminal atoms are. So the central atom tends to be, okay, the less electronegative atom and the terminal tends to be the more electronegative atoms. Another way of putting it is the central atom tends to be the first in the name, in the formula, and the, you know, other in the formula, last in formula. Okay, so NH4. In this case, nitrogen is actually more electronegative. But here's the kicker with NH4. Hydrogen, despite being less electronegative, it can only do two, right? Remember the duet rule is a special to hydrogen? Well, if you're about to bond multiple things and you're about to be a central atom, it's gotta be able to handle access to more electrons. And if you max out at two, you max out at one bond. So hydrogen is never, ever a central atom. It breaks this rule. Okay, so here, but notice how we write it. N goes first. So that's how we signal to somebody, hey, this is the central atom. So we draw a skeleton. You have to have at least one bond to each of the terminals. That's your skeleton. That's your bare minimum bonding is one bond. Okay, so I have one bond 
between each around the central. So now I need to count up. I've just redistributed some of my food, my potluck, my electrons. So how many out of the total did I redistribute? I redistribute two times four because I have four single bonds, two electrons for every single. So I've used up all eight of my electrons. Now I need to look at it and say, okay, did the way I distribute get me to what I want, which is either the duet rule for hydrogen or helium or the octet rule, okay? And so I look and I say, well, hydrogen has access to these two. Hydrogen has access to these two. These two and G willikers, these two. Now I need to look at the central atom because we take care of the outers first, okay? And I gotta say, okay, well, did the way I distribute these give my central atom, which is not hydrogen, so it needs an octet access to eight. And I do see that I have eight access, two, four, six, eight. And so what we see is nitrogen gets access to eight through purely sharing means. And notice I had a charge, right? The only way I got the structure was with a specific count of electrons. So this Lewis structure diagram that we have needs to also show that we have a plus charge being carried by this molecule. So with a plus charge, we bracket the entire molecule and we write the charge on the outside. And that is how you draw Lewis structures, but we have a ton of exceptions. We have a ton of rule breakers. So here's some pro tips to initially get you through. And honestly, I would recommend after class, you take the time to write out this uh, step process or look at my hyperlinked uh, cheat sheet. But pro tips, hydrogen and halogens are always terminal. They can never be central, are always terminal atoms. They're never ever central. Two, the central atom is usually, right, the first written in the name, okay? Or the less electronegative, okay? Or carbon. Carbon loves being the center. Carbon is extremely narcissistic. Carbon is the backbone of organic chemistry. Carbon loves being the center. There are very, very few molecules where carbon is a terminal atom. Actually, I can't even think of one. A true terminal, I can't even think of one. Um, when you form double and triple bonds, because at some point you'll need to form double and triple bonds. We all know that the molecules out there exist. That only occurs as a last resort mean. Okay, as a last resort uh, for when you are lacking electrons to distribute. So let's say, right, when you go to a potluck, they didn't bring enough food. I recently held a host at a party and I asked everyone to bring food. They bought too much. We had a lot left over. But let's say they didn't bring enough, okay? What would we have to do after the first people go through the line? We would have to say, yo, actually, can we redistribute? Can you share more? Double and triple bonds are more sharing of electrons. Four electrons shared in a double, six in a triple. So if you run out of the electrons, if you run out of your potluck electron count, then you need to share more, okay? But we that's a last resort because we don't want to share. We're greedy humans. We're very individualistic as a society. Absolutely, I don't share food. Are you kidding me? The serving size is my size for that meal. There is no leftovers. That is a farce. No leftovers, okay? Um, we, of course, bracket charged molecules because we have to show that we didn't just get that structure with that specific electron count from by itself. It had to have a specific charge characteristic to get that count of electrons to get that unique distribution of electrons, okay? And then, of course, a noble gas. This is where we get unique. Most of the time, noble gases are inert, but, 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 Noble gases can form what we call an expanded octet. And this means that they have to be the central atom. So there are times when the noble gases get called into battle to do what only they can do. Huzzah. Okay. You know, I got to make this exciting for you guys because it's a lot of info. And if I read it like a textbook, I'd sound like the, what was that? Fiat Fairler Bueller's Day Off. Fairly, 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 even more than my little Minnie Mouse voice does. Yeah. So let's do one together and I'm going to have you guys do the other alone. So phosphorus trichloride, huh? I'll tell you in a second. 
Phosphorus trichloride. Don't you worry, Liam. I will never leave you hanging unless I run out of time. Then I will leave you hanging. Oh, <laughs> uh, you joke. Uh, <laughs> this case is not really casing. Um, I need, hey, teacher appreciation gift, folks, other than food, other than food. Teacher appreciation. Um, I refuse to buy a new computer case. If someone would like me to buy, would like to buy a $13 computer case off of Amazon, this is a Mac Air Book Air 13 inch, I believe. Um, <laughs> I don't want to pay the district for ruining the computer. <laughs> okay, so let's start with uh, PCL3, phosphorus trichloride. Okay, so phosphorus, each phosphorus comes in with five valence electrons. Each chlorine comes in with seven. So it becomes a total valence electron count of 21 plus 526. I don't have any charge, so I don't need to count for add or subtract, okay? And notice, if you have a positive charge, you subtract electrons. If you have a negative charge, you add electrons. Don't forget that charge is representing, that number is representing a charge, not just a math problem, okay? So I now create my skeleton. Well, the first element is phosphorus. It's also the less electronegative. So we know it's the center element. So now I graph everything around it, okay? And then I count, I've used up six to build my skeleton. We're starting to redistribute our potluck of electrons. So now I have 20, can I do math? Yes, 20 electrons still available to me. Now I start with my terminal atoms and I go starting with my terminal, I get everybody to fill an octet. And I actually do this one at a time. Kind of like in the line, a potluck line. You go one at a time filling up your plate. You don't go around and serve. Here's your salad, here's your salad, here's your salad. Here's your beans, here's your beans, here's your beans. Here's your corn, here's your corn, here's your corn. You expect them to fill their plate one at a time. Same thing here. So right now each chlorine has currently access to two electrons through this shared single bond, but it wants eight. So now I'm going to give it its own six to get it to eight. So I give it three lone pairs. It's three pairs of lonely unbonded electrons, like many of us. Okay. Do, 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 do. And I have just given every chlorine. Oh, my chlorine, my CLs kind of look like my Gs. It's a C L. It's a C L. Okay. Now I have just used up six times three, 18, and I still have two left. I completed every octet first, okay? And then I have two left. Well, I can't give any more to chlorines. No chlorine at this point wants any more. It's got its octet. It's got its six single and it's two shared. So now it's at eight. It's happy. It's a happy, happy, happy little camper. So now what we do is we look at the central atom. Why? Because the person holding everybody together is usually the one forgot, right? The last one to get taken care of. Uh, yeah, it's called your mothers. Thank your mothers. Don't forget Mother's Day is coming up in May. Lavish your mother with flowers and love and do the dishes without complaining and cook her a meal for God's sake, okay? Um, unless you're a bad cook, buy her the meal. <laughs> So what do we do now? We look at the central atom, the one holding everybody together, the selfless one. And we say, did you finally get your needs met? And what do we have? What does phosphorus currently have access to? Six. Six. So how many more does it need? Six. How many more do we have? Six. Ayo. So we got two and boom, bada bing. And by the way, you have to eat all the food. You have to use up all the electrons. If you're not using up all the electrons, you cannot just leave them remaining. Yes. Because of the three single bonds. Each single bond contains two shared electrons. Yeah. So now we have our structure. Now we go around and we say, well, did we do it? Did we did we do it, folks? Octet, 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 octet. Yes, bada bing, bada boom. You have a valid Lewis structure, a valid representation of how the electrons are shared. Yes. Um, does it always happen that all atoms have an octet? Or like if you're using you're about to learn about uh you're about to learn about the special conditions. So yes. You'll see. Okay. So uh let's do let's have you just do one. Let's do have you do number two by yourself, and then I'll walk you through number three and number four. 
Okay, for this one, this was unique because remember, carbon tends to be the central, so you should have set it up like something like this. I don't really know where you put your H's. Maybe you put them above. I don't know, but that's the idea. Your total valence electron count was what, folks? 20, 20, 20. So you used up eight. You have 12 left. Hydrogen already has its duet. So you never, ever see hydrogen at your level of chemistry. You never, ever see hydrogen with lone pairs at your level of chemistry. So now we go around filling out the terminal. Are you leaving already? Aw. Now you go and fill, fill out the terminal. Give them their octet. And lo and behold, what happens? You use up all of them. Everybody has an octet. What a beautiful structure. Bye. Julian left, heartbroken. Parents, Julian was an old student of mine. We rest in peace. Um, so, RIP Julian. Okay, what about the next one? This is different. Look at HCN. Cyanitrile. Don't remember the name. Anyway, here we have H written first, but what can H never be? Central, but what does carbon love to be? Like me. So, jokes, jokes. I'm actually quite humble outside the classroom. Um, <laughs> so, um, you're, you know what? So, what you do is you do total valence electrons. Sorry, I realized I skip ahead because I already know. Okay, what is the valence electron count? Carbon, four, nitrogen, five, hydrogen, one, 10. You just learned to start memorizing the periodic table. Okay, I've used up four for my initial skeleton. I have six left. Hydrogen doesn't want any more, so I start with my nitrogen octet. Uh-oh, that gives me no left. This is what I mean by you need to form a double and triple bond if you run out of electrons, if you don't have enough. It's a last resort. So what do we have? We have carbon with only four. Carbon wants eight. Oh, gee, Willikers, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to ask nitrogen to share more because hydrogen's got nothing to share. It's maxed out, okay? It's like that one friend that had one job. It's like, that's all they can do. That's all you give them, right? Like some of those, no, just kidding. Um, anyway, so, um, <laughs> so what you do is you fold in. Remember, you cannot make up more electrons, but you cannot just also not use electrons. So you got to figure out how to ask someone to share more. Nitrogen has more to share. So nitrogen will share. And the new compound, the correct one, will be HC triple bond N. And now everybody has an octet with a lone pair on the outside. And now everybody has an octet or their respective duet. Boom. Okay, what about beryllium difluoride? Shh. Beryllium difluoride. This is going to have two plus seven plus seven. Four, whoa, 14, 18. Whoa, 16. Okay, so 16 valence electrons. You're gonna put beryllium in the middle. You're gonna do the two Fs on the side, okay? And that's using up four. Now you have 12 left. Now you're, that looks like an R. I fully recognize that. That looks like an R. Okay, that doesn't look like a two. Now you're going to fill out the terminals. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And you look at it and you say, oh no, beryllium doesn't have an octet. But halogens can't make double bonds or multiple bonds at all. So what do we have? We have a special case. Beryllium is chilling with four. Beryllium is a special case where it is okay with what we call an incomplete octet. It's not a duet. It's not a duet. It's not hydrogen or helium but it's chilling. It's like your stereotypical skater dude doesn't need much, okay? Just vibing, just vibing with the times, okay? So your beryllium is your surfer bro, okay? So that leads me to, we're gonna skip over those for a second, and that leads me to incomplete octet. Uh, we will warm up tomorrow with this. This will be our warm up. Please, someone remind me that. Okay, this will be our warm up tomorrow. Now let's get to incomplete octet, the exceptions to the octet rule. We've already learned about one other than the duet rule. There is beryllium, boron, and aluminum. They're actually all okay with less than octet. 
Um, beryllium, boron, and aluminum are chilling with four or six. In fact, uh, aluminum loves having six, and beryllium and boron love having four. It's great. Okay. Um, then we have the odd number, odd electron molecules. And this is where we get often single electron, what we call free radicals, the things that give you cancer, the things that age you, the things that the sun, which is why you should all wear sunscreen, all right, do to you, inside of you. The only reason a lot of you guys aren't dying of cancer right now is that your body can fight off the free radicals. What are antioxidants? They're free radical opposers, okay? Um, by the way, there was a recent study uh, that actually showed that cancer has less to do with your genetics and diet and more to do with your just random amount of your body's ability to fight free radicals. Tom. Is that random ability not optimized? Uh, it's influenced, but not completely direct. Yeah, but you know, that was just kind of one couple of recent studies, but it could be developing still. So what we have is nitrogen monoxide. Nitrogen monoxide has 11 valence electrons. Okay, uh, there's actually two forms of structures that we could have for it. We call those resonance structures. I'll get into that in the end. Um, but you could have drawn two according to the rules. But either way, uh, what you would see is that nitrogen has this one random, not even a lone pair, but like a lone lone one, like a lonely wolf. Ah, ooh, electron. Okay, it's your lonely wolf. Ah, ooh. This morning at 5 a.m., the coyotes were like mating and like because they have like a mate call. And they have like that, this like screechy howl. It was awful. All of them are going like, ah, like it was so bad. So no, it was like, it was like at 5 a.m. this morning, they woke us all up because it was just like this whole pack that was howling. Um, so the other one is nitrogen dioxide. Nitrogen dioxide. It has 17 valence electrons. Notice there's no even number. So you're probably going to get a free radical in there. Nitrogen is a common element to take on the free radical. It's common, yeah, just common element that does it. I'm not gonna get into why. I don't even know if I fully understand why, it just does, okay? And here you'll see you have two resonance technically. I'll explain what that means in a little bit, but you'll see there's a free radical on it. Both are valid according to elect, uh, Lewis structure rules about how to draw these, all right? So those are special and that's what beryllium kind of introduced to us, but, there is another category and it's called expanded octet, expanded octet. And this, by the way, I should not have written C section above. I forgot to take that out. This occurs, this occurs when elements in row three or above uh, can handle more than eight valence electrons. And why is that the case? Why? Because elements in row three and above have access to a D or F orbital. Is that eight? That I, I understand, I understand. Have access <laughs> to a D or F orbital, right? Because when you're in element row three or above, you technically have an unfilled 3D. You technically have an unfilled 3F, a 4D, a 4F, a 5D, a 5F. There's not the same thing as a 3F. Sorry, 3D, and then they have a 4D, and then you have a 5D, 5F, 6D, 6F? No, just 6D. There it is. So, guys, I'm going off the memory. Okay, so either way, you have access to a D or F orbital, okay? So you can handle more. So, for example, let's go up above. Xenon chloride, tetrachloride. Notice this noble gas. Wow. Coming in, coming in for the clutch moment, okay? It is going to have attached, okay? This structure, the total valence electrons is going to be xenon eight plus seven chlorines. Whoa, seven, four, four sevens, four sevens. <laughs> 28 plus eight is 36. You know, the funny thing is I got to a really high level of math in college. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to follow my rules. I've used up uh, eight already. So I'm left with, why was I about to go higher? 28. <laughs> okay, I'm going to fill out my octet for every terminal. 
And it's halogen, so I can't make a double bond. I've just done six times four, 24. So I have four. And now I have to ask myself, where does the other four go? Well, I can't put it anywhere else, so it has to go on the central. But that means, by the way, that xenon now has access to two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. And it's okay with that. It's okay, xenon has access to 12 valence electrons and it's okay with that. By the way, those lone pairs around the central atom take up space. They actually often take up more space than you would think because they're just big fat packet of negativity. It's like, you know those, like what are those sumo wrestler suits that you put on that are like super balloony and you see people dancing in them? That's a lone pair electron in the central. They're nothing but air, but they take up a lot of space. Okay. Do you like my analogies? Yes. Why couldn't you just add another bond? Because wouldn't that be two electrons? Bonded to what? Just add another bond. Yeah, to chlorine and because can, chlorine can't handle a um, double bond or triple bond. Oh yeah, because the electrons are already full. This just because of halogens. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yep. Because they can't. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's row two. Chlorine? Because it doesn't want to. <laughs> no, you could technically, according to theory, but it won't. Okay, so, um... Let's look at another expanded octet. I want you guys to try these two, SO3 and SF6, and then we'll do warm up on the rest of these tomorrow. So go ahead and try those two. Okay. First one, SO3. Uh, what was the total valence electron count? 24. One year younger than me. Um, okay. I miss being 24. No, actually 24 was a terrible year. Just kidding. Uh, this year is way better. So, K, S, O. Oh, oh. Uh, you should have gone, you could have gotten two types of structures. You could have gotten this structure. Okay. Uh, six, six, or you could have gotten, oh, why did I put this as a span octet? I don't think I meant to, I think I meant to put SO4 to minus. Whoops. Anyway, oh well. Uh, good practice, guys. Good practice. Or you could have gotten a structure where you folded in one of these and it made a double bond somewhere. That was optional. Because the sulfur still wants an octet or more. So if you left it without, uh, it wouldn't have an octet. So actually, this is the only structure that works. JK. Oh, actually, no, I was right. There's more resonance. I'll introduce that in a second. Okay, this was a bad place to put this one. This is more of an example of, we'll just say warm up. Like theoretically, you always want to make. Yes, and this is a sneak up, sneak peek into resonance. I'm going to put that note to myself. Always, always, always. Yes. So if you're an expanded octet, it means you want eight or more. You still want eight. Okay, now the next one is a true expanded octet. I apologize. I didn't catch that earlier, so I apologize. All right. This is sulfur hexafluoride. Sulfur hexafluoride is a gas, and it's really toxic. Huh? So. And it would have been filled out completely. Sulfur would have access to 10... No, 12 electrons. It's too powerful. It is. I love that. Who said that? <laughs> that is cute. It's too powerful. Okay. So uh, tomorrow we'll warm up with the other ones, but this was an actual example. This was an actual example of standard octet. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about resonance. And this is your sneak peek into resonance, SO3. This occurs when there is more than one valid Lewis structure. More than one. K, 
Okay, valid Lewis structure for a molecule, Malcolm. It doesn't mean it's good for you. You shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be doing it. Uh, although I have been on helium once. Oh, here we go. I'm on helium once. I've been on helium once, and it was really funny. You thought my voice couldn't get worse, so let me tell you. It gets way worse. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like me on two times speed, which I know some of you watch me on two times speed. Okay, so um, the actual structure is a blend or is an average between the valid Lewis structure. So kind of like isotopes, but now we're looking at a structural isotope. Okay, now we're looking at a molecule that can exist in various different forms. So in reality, it kind of exists all of them at the same time. For some cases, for some, there's still one that's fair, like just far more favorable and would be the dominant form of it. Uh, for others, though, uh, you'll see quickly that the terminal atoms are what we call chemically equivalent. They're the same terminal atom. It's just where we put the double bond. So we say that they are a blend. So going back to bond order, if you look at ozone, ozone, okay, three oxygens bonded in a bent shape, okay, of some sort. Um, what we have is ozone technically has three, two structures, two resonance. A resonance is a Lewis structure. A Lewis structure is not always a resonance because resonance implies that there's more than one Lewis structure for the same molecule. So here we have two resonance, okay, present. And what we say is that the bond order across the molecule is technically one and a half. The resonance provided one and two bond order structure. But the reality is, is that one, you have two terminally chemically equivalent. They're both oxygens. So the double bond can flip either side spatially. Okay. I think that's like a TikTok dance move, but I'm not sure. Okay. They can flip spatially. So you'd say the actual molecule exists in this one and a half zone where you kind of have a half of a bond. And if you're like, that doesn't make sense. Remember, electrons are in a mathematical region of probability. That's an orbital. So technically, it can float within the region. Ayo. Yes. What? Who was raising their hand? Alec. Annalise. So the, like, electrons, I guess, that is like a literal representation, or is it more of like the atomic mass being an average? No, it's a, it's a pretty literal representation. The bonds exist halfway. Because the electrons are in a zone of overlap where they would be shared. Halfway across the molecule. Yes. So, like halfway, they're resonating between the two? Yes. Okay. Sam? Thank you. Um, so, when do we check for resonance? Because not every single molecule has multiple valid versions of itself. Alec? Um, so, when we're dealing with the probability distribution, does that mean that, like, does it behave any differently than it would in each of the different molecules? Or is it like something? Else? Depending. That's where we get into enantiomers and stereoisomers, and you will get into it at the end of the semester when you're doing your drug research project. Drugs, right? Ooh. So fun. So for the, <laughs> for the video. So when to technically, by the way, you will probably all birth under drugs, right? Your mother probably took some type of drug to birth you, right? You, your mom did that by without any medicine. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm going to be like, hit me up. I be <laughs> So, <laughs> when to check for resonance. Okay, when to check for resonance. You have the presence of a double or triple bond. I really hope that this is entertaining for you guys because I'm like recycling jokes. Um, this is a double or triple bond. So, um, here's why we check for resonance. Not every single double or triple bond means that you can have resonance. Because remember, there are some that just can't handle it. So if you like tried to move a double bond around to hydrogen, it'd be like, no. If you tried to move a double bond around to a uh, halogen, it'd be like, no. So sometimes you don't have any options. But let's say you do have a double triple bond, just like in the ozone, and you have terminal atoms that can handle double or triple. Then you check if there's other ways you can structure it. You can distribute that still meet all the rules. The Lewis structure rules don't go away here. Okay. Um, another time is when the molecule has what we call equivalent. 
Another way of putting it is same, terminal atoms. So it's, again, example above, it's two oxygens on both sides. They're gonna behave the same. They're just spatially different. They're just spatially different. Yes, Liam. Can you have like a third of it on? Ow. Yes. Yes, but that's really, really rare. Really rare. I can't even think of one that I've studied or worked with. Know, uh, most resonance tend to be within the double. You very rarely have a triple. Is it not? I feel like it's less rare than you think it is. Oh, I guess I'm thinking of a triple bond floating around. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, because the structure would still be one and a half, because it'd be a double bond being shifted, but the the bond characteristic would should be one and a half. Am I thinking of this funky donkey? This, this, no, that's not it. I don't think so. Mm, I have to do more research. I've never really thought about that, to be honest. Yes, Annalise. Oh, no. Okay. Oh, these what ifs. At the same time, that in the same molecule, a double bond is floating around. What kind of resonance is that? I'm going to ignore your what if. I don't want to answer that. Okay, moving on. Don't care. So let's look at nitrate. <laughs> so I got to finish this. I really do. So a lot of my jokes are just stall so you guys can write, but we do have to get through this. So nitrate, okay, resonance would look like this. Here's one possible resonance. I'm not going to explain how you make it. You should know how. Here's another possible resonance. Yep, that's it, yeah, folks. Here's another possible resonance. Are you being immature right now, Maggie? Okay. I know you guys gotta stand, sit, sit on those stools, ruin your backs. Wait. Um. Okay. What did we notice? We just moved the bond around. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, it's like the round. Of, what is that round of applause? Right. Never You've never done round of applause as a kid? No, Give them the I'm round not. of applause? No. Oh my God, you guys, you're killing me. You're killing me. So the next one, it won't be too hard. It's very similar. You probably could fill it in as I do it myself. You don't even need me. Maggie. <laughs> yeah, Maggie. Hi, I don't know you. Nice glasses, though. Thanks. It looks like my goggles. Hey, yo. Oh my god, your glasses are great. <laughs> what? They're good goggles. They're anti fog. I got them for Christmas. It was like my big Christmas gift. Okay. You just broke my nose. Uh, <laughs> Jaden, I don't know when my convenience is. Uh, Alec, I don't know when my convenience is. So, my dad said if teaching doesn't work out for me, I could go in as a comedian, one woman show, but I don't think I'm funny unless I have like interaction. <laughs> you know as a kid I took a personality test of like this 23 characteristics and this was an eighth grade and humor was my 23rd <laughs> and I, I like to say I've improved <laughs> okay so that would be the resonance for these okay now here's the thing sometimes you don't have necessarily chemically equivalent resonances Sometimes you have multiple versions and you're like, I don't know which one's the best because there is a better one. All of these, there's no real better one. It's kind of like, mm, it's the blend. But sometimes you do. So what we do is we assign fake charges. That's right, folks. Let's go into non-reality. We assign fake charges, okay? And these are entirely fake charges. I realize that this looks like, oh, 
sake. Okay. <laughs> Charges. Okay. Uh, two individual atoms. Uh, oh, a sign. Okay. To determine the most likely resonance. Sorry, I'm getting shaky. Mm. Oh man. To determine the most likely. Mm. Okay, resonance. The equation is quite advanced, so be prepared. It is formal charge equals valence electrons minus dots plus line. That's your, that's your formula. <laughs> yeah, so let's take carbon dioxide, for example. Okay, here you would think these are chemically equivalent, but they're not, right? Unlike SO3 and NO3, where you just move the double bond around, right, round of applause, okay? It really doesn't change anything, it's a spatial change. But these resonants actually do have a structural change to it. One is made of two doubles, one's made of a single and a triple. So now you gotta think to yourself, okay, which one's the most likely? Now you all know what carbon dioxide already looks like. The question is why? How did we determine that that's the one it should look like? Well, formal charge says, I assign a fake charge, a formal charge to each atom in a molecule. And so I say the oxygen, it starts off with six valence electrons. That's the valence electrons that oxygen brings into the party. But according to this structure, it has four dots and two lines. So it has a formal charge of zero, plus zero. And it would be for this as well, because they are chemically and structurally equivalent. Now, what about the carbon? Okay, carbon comes in with four valence electrons and it has four dots and, sorry, four lines and no dots. So it also is zero. So we give it a formal charge of zero. Notice something about how I write the charge. It is the sign and then the number. That's formal charge. If you write number then sign, you're telling me that's the actual ion charge. Formal means fake. Because formal people are hooty tooty and they tend to be fake. That's how you can remember it. Okay? Some call me bougie. Yes. Hello, how'd it go? Oh no. So if you do the number and then this <laughs> sign, this is a real charge. Please don't. Okay. So now we look at the next structures. Now here we have oxygen would be the right oxygen would be six minus three dots plus two lines, giving me a formal charge of plus one. Carbon would be four minus four, <clears throat> still zero. The left oxygen would be six minus six dots plus one line, okay? That would be negative one. So we have a plus one and a minus one formal charge and a plus zero. And what would happen is we see this other structure is flipped, okay? We just flip the doodah, the math, and it becomes the right oxygen has a plus one. The carbon has a zero and the left oxygen has a minus one. And here's why we like this. Because if we look at our formal charge rules, which is on the next page, there are specific principles that we use to determine whether this is valid or not. The first is the preferred Lewis structure is the one where the sum, that's the sum symbol, sum of the charges, formal charges, fake charges, equals the charge of the molecule. So if you have a neutral molecule, everything should add up to zero. Notice all of these structures do add up to zero. It's just how they add up to zero that matters. Two, the formal charge of each atom should be closest to zero. We like zeros. Okay, the sum of all formal charges should add up to the ion charge if it's a polyatomic. And finally, the most electronegative atoms should carry the negative formal charge if there has to be one. So why does carbon dioxide have the structure preferred of two double bonds? It adds up to zero. Everybody has a zero. The most electronegative charge, we don't even have a negative, so it doesn't even matter. Boom, that's the better one. 
The other ones have non-zero formal charges and you have a chemically equivalent oxygens carrying a minus and a positive? No. There are no such things as electropositive oxygens at your level of chemistry. At advanced level of chemistry, yes, there is. They're called MOOF, okay? There's a literal uh, reaction, uh, reaction mechanism called MOOF where you create a positive uh, elect uh, oxygen. It's kind of cool. MOOF. Okay, so your homework and warm up tomorrow will be, and you could do this now, figure out, this is the hint of how to draw the structure, figure out the three types of formal uh, resonance, and then tell me which is the most legitimate according to formal charge. Start on that now until the end of class. Just start one, doing it. One quick thing, Judy. Yes, what's um, the one quick thing? The way I like to think about the formal charge and the way it makes sense, it's the, the atoms wanting zero formal charge represents them wanting to have access to the same number of electrons as they came in with. You take the number of electrons they started with and mm. subtract the, the dots the fake and the lines, and they're more stable with the same number or close to the same number of electrons, electrons they started with. Excellent. 